Bankruptcy Mediations, part two of a two-part series, a conversation with Sylvia Mayer. That is our topic for today. Welcome to the Lawyers and Mediators International Show and Podcast by InstantMediations.com, where we discuss law and conflict resolution topics to educate both professionals and everyday people. Catch regular episodes on YouTube, the Instant Mediations app, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Just remember, nothing in these episodes constitutes legal advice, so be sure to talk to a lawyer as cases are fact-dependent. Hi, everyone. Mac Pierre-Louis, attorney, mediator, and arbitrator, working throughout Florida and Texas. And Natalia Łowska-Czajka, advocat, mediator, and arbitrator from Warsaw, Poland. Hi, I'm Sylvia Mayer. Thank you for having me back. I am an attorney, an arbitrator, and a mediator located in Texas. Thank you again, Sylvia, for being with us here today and wanting to expand more on the bankruptcy issues. As we identified, there is so much more we can say. Closing up the previous episode, um, I touched on some peculiarities of the, um, of the Polish law, which I thought were peculiarities, meaning we have privileged creditors, we have priority creditors. And I wanted to ask you, Sylvia, if Poland is really so special, how is uh, U.S. Ba bankruptcy law, um, what is U.S. bankruptcy law saying about it? We, in, under U.S. bankruptcy law, we have similar priority creditors. And so I believe in the last call or the last discussion, we talked about uh, the priority scheme or waterfall for claims. And so under the bankruptcy code, secured creditors come first, then unsecured creditors, and then equity holders. But unsecured creditors are really divided into two categories. One category are priority creditors and the other is general unsecured. And the priority creditors come first. They come ahead of the general unsecured creditors and they are creditors or groups of creditors that Congress decided should get priority treatment, meaning they should have to be paid before you have any money left over to pay the unsecured creditors. And examples of priority creditors cover all sorts of things. Um, in a consumer case, it might include child support, for example. Uh, in um, business cases or consumer cases, it might include tax obligations. It also, uh, in business cases, frequently a big component of it is certain employee obligations. And so there's a lot of different things that get picked up in the priority scheme. And for those of us who are attorneys, one of the really important parts is that as counsel for the debtor or if any special groups are appointed by the judge, like a creditor's committee, uh, their professional fees are also treated as a special priority claim. Thank you for that. And you mentioned a second ago, one of the priorities is when you're dealing with child support issues or child support arrears and those kind of debts. Um, that's a family law issue, more or less, right? Can you go into a little bit of discussion on how bankruptcy law and family law intersect? Nothing too, too deep. Um, but just because Natalia and I do a whole lot of family law, we kind of wanted to hear your perspective. In some ways, the two worlds might collide. Absolutely. So I touched on that um, child support and certain other obligations that might be in a divorce decree or settlement uh, are going to be treated as priority claims in a bankruptcy case. Another really unique aspect of bankruptcy is if, for example, a husband and wife have filed for divorce and one of them uh, files bankruptcy, it is possible that the bankruptcy judge will pull some aspects of that divorce proceeding into the bankruptcy court and hear the dispute over, for example, property distribution, because that includes assets uh, that are wrapped up in the bankruptcy case. This is fascinating. And that brings us to the um, very important question for our listeners and viewers, which is the, um, how would uh, the mediation work for a consumer or how would it work for entrepreneur? What are the differences between 
mediation uh, in consumer and commercial bankruptcy cases? So there's a lot of similarity in mediating both consumer and commercial bankruptcy disputes because you have the bankruptcy code as the backdrop for any resolution that would come out of a mediation. And you have a party who owes money who's called a debtor. Uh, whether it's consumer or commercial, they're the debtor. Um, but after that, it can get very different. So for example, in a consumer bankruptcy case, you may be dealing with things like, you know, we touched on possibly property division if there's a pending divorce, but, but typically what you would see is things like uh, their mortgage uh, or a creditor who has challenged whether that consumer is entitled to a discharge uh, and other similar litigation where whatever the issue is, it is frequently a two or possibly three party dispute because in most consumer bankruptcy cases, there's a trustee involved as well. In contrast, in a commercial bankruptcy case, uh, there's a myriad of possibilities of what you could be mediating. So it could be a straight up two party dispute such as a, an avoidance action or a preference action. Uh, or it could be a multi-party, multifaceted dispute, such as negotiating what the Chapter 11 plan might look like, uh, or some big issue in the case that needs to be resolved in order for the parties to move forward with plan negotiations. And so there are, as there are both similarities and differences there, and they require. Uh, different skill sets. And so depending on which type of dispute you have, you may want to be thinking about what it is you're looking for in selecting a mediator. Yeah. And uh, we would encourage folks who are watching or listening to go back to the first uh, video because you gave us a little bit of a bankruptcy 101 to kind of help explain what some of these terms mean and the different types of bankruptcy you know, cases out there. Um, because I know you mentioned chapter 11 a second ago, and so that's something that we would have hit on last time. So, uh, Sylvia, remind us how long you've been an attorney doing bankruptcy cases and how long have you been mediating? So I've been practicing law for almost 30 years, and uh, a significant part of my practice for that time has always been bankruptcy, primarily commercial bankruptcy, representing companies. Uh, typically in a chapter 11, occasionally in a chapter seven, but typically in an 11. Uh, in 2014, I uh, left the large law firm where I had worked for 20 plus years and uh, set up a solo law and ADR practice and started doing uh, a significant amount of mediation and arbitration. And so I've been mediating and arbitrating since then. And um it is a big part of what I do in terms of mediation is bankruptcy mediation. Gotcha. And I asked about um, the length of time you've been doing this because I wanted to know you've probably seen or experienced a whole lot of creative solutions whenever you're dealing with different disputes between parties. So are there opportunities for creativity in settling bankruptcy disputes? One of the things that I love the most about mediating bankruptcy disputes is that the bankruptcy court is a court of equity, which gives you tremendous flexibility in developing a resolution framework. So there's a lot of opportunity for creativity. And whether or not there's a mediator involved in a Chapter 11 case, it is always all about negotiating an outcome. And so sometimes the parties can get there on their own and they have their own creativity and ways to solve whatever the underlying issues and interests may be. But frequently they need a third party to come in and help them work through those issues in the form of a mediator. And you can, you have to use as the, as the construct, the bankruptcy code. You can't throw the bankruptcy code provisions out the door, uh, but with that structure, you have a lot of creativity around who gets what, when they get it, how it's structured, and um, what the company is going to do in order to satisfy their claims. Are they going to sell assets? Are they going to reorganize? Is there going to be some combination of those two things? When they pay people, are they going to pay this type of interest? Is the interest going to have an escalator? Is the interest going to be paid 
uh, periodically, or is it going to be pick interest that's put at the end? Is There's all sorts of different things. Will there be any incentives for an earlier payout? Will there be an opportunity for a creditor to elect to take a discount uh, and take a, uh, and get paid sooner? There's a myriad of variables that can go into resolving a commercial bankruptcy case. And it's a great opportunity for creativity. Since you mentioned that so much cre creativity can be engaged, uh, it actually brings me back to the issue that it is a legal dispute in a way. It's being placed with the courts. So who is this creativity up to? Who are the mediators uh, in the bankruptcy cases, but also what um, percentage of creativity goes to the parties, to the creditor and to the debtor? Um, so let me break that down. So in terms of who can mediate a bankruptcy dispute, I think it depends on the dispute. So if you have a straight up two-party fight about, make up an example, there was a lawsuit prior to the bankruptcy filing. It's now in the bankruptcy just because it's become a claim in the bankruptcy. Well, anyone who could have mediated it outside of bankruptcy can probably mediate it inside of bankruptcy, as long as they understand that what will be paid on that claim will not necessarily be whole dollars. It will be paid in accordance with the bankruptcy code or the plan if there's a Chapter 11 case. Um so it is not uncommon for somebody who has limited or no bankruptcy experience to mediate those types of disputes. When you get to the more complicated bankruptcy matters, uh, for example, an out-of-court or in-court restructuring, or if there's for perhaps an issue over use of cash collateral or financing in the bankruptcy case, or some other thing that is really a core issue under the bankruptcy code, uh, you really need a mediator who understands bankruptcy because they won't, if you have someone who doesn't understand bankruptcy, they're not going to understand when somebody says they're asking for something that simply cannot be delivered uh, because it violates the bankruptcy code. You're not going to know. Um, whereas if you have a bankruptcy a mediator who knows bankruptcy, it's helpful because they can ask questions like, well, how are you planning to do that? Because X, Y, Z provision of the bankruptcy code comes into play there. Uh, and so I think in those situations, you do need uh, somebody who has bankruptcy experience. And in terms of who has the opportunity for creativity, everyone has the opportunity for creativity. So um, it, when I do a large multi-party complex commercial bankruptcy mediation. Uh, I will frequently say to people, either in a, a phone call during my preparations for the mediation or for purposes of what I asked for in their confidential mediation statements, I will ask them, throw all the spaghetti on the wall. Think as far outside the box as you can go and tell me what you think are possible resolutions here, even if you don't think they'd be acceptable, even if you don't think they'd be feasible. Just Put it all out there because maybe we can draw a piece from here and a piece from there and a piece from someone else and craft a resolution that solves this dilemma. Thank you. And so uh, here's a question. Can sitting judges um, mediate a bankruptcy case? It is very common uh, for sitting judges to refer a dispute to another sitting judge. I'm in Houston and the bankruptcy judges here in Houston actually refer some disputes to one another on a regular basis. Uh, but uh, obviously there are also opportunities for private mediators. And so you see both. You will sometimes see uh, disputes that go to the judges and sometimes you'll see disputes that go to private mediators. And some of that depends on the nature of the dispute. So I, I mentioned before and in our prior conversation about avoidance actions and preference actions, which there might be a large Chapter 11 case where they file two, three, four hundred of these lawsuits. Well, that's not something that most judges want to uh, be selected as mediator for because they still have their own docket, right? They're still sitting on the bench. Uh, so typically those kinds of matters would go to private mediators where you sometimes see bankruptcy judges sitting as mediator in another judge's case is when you have some of these more complicated plan issues. Those types of issues 
private mediators certainly handle. I've mediated many of those types of disputes, and I know others have as well. But that's a place where it's not uncommon to see a bankruptcy judge refer the matter to another bankruptcy judge. Thank you. Okay, so are there any unique considerations for mediated settlements and bankruptcy? Absolutely. So I've I've mentioned several times that the sort of backbone or the framework or structure of any settlement you would achieve in a bankruptcy mediation still has to conform to the bankruptcy code. And so that means that you're not going to craft a mediated settlement agreement, tell the judge, see ya, <laughs> we settled, we're out of here. Um, and depending on what the dispute is, act, you know, obviously, but you, if you have a dispute, for example, a plan negotiation, and that has been resolved through mediation, they still have to go to the bankruptcy court. They have to go back to the bankruptcy court. They have to explain to the judge, this is what we agreed upon. This is why this is a good idea. And um, if, particularly if it's in the plan context, they may then need to uh, send out notice to all of their creditors and disclose, here's what we agreed to. This is why it's good. This is why you should vote for it. You should support this mediated settlement and ask those creditors to submit a vote. And then the judge considers it. So in contrast to a lot of mediated settlement agreements that we each of us deal with in places outside of bankruptcy, where the parties agree to a settlement, now the lawsuit is dismissed, and no one ever really knows what that settlement was, in bankruptcy, it's very common that it's, it's all out there. Now, what you discuss in mediation may still be confidential, uh, and that's sometimes dependent upon the order that was entered governing the mediation. But there may be a need for the debtor to disclose the risks and benefits associated with the settlement. I had a um, complicated bankruptcy mediation a couple of years ago where we quickly reached a resolution, but spent the second half of the day negotiating what and how the disclosure would be handled and what the process would, be look, would look like in terms of uh, putting the information into the disclosure statement, going to the court, distributing it, and so that is another sort of layer of complication in a bankruptcy case. The flip side to that is there are also disputes where the parties will go to the judge and say, or, or the debtor will go to the judge and say, I have a whole bunch of these disputes. So let's just use the example I gave before of preference or avoidance actions where there could be hundreds of lawsuits. And they will say, judge, I want you to say that if I have a dispute for less than some threshold, that I can just settle those, or I can just settle those as long as this one third party approves of it. And only if I have it, if it's above that threshold, do I have to come back to you? And sometimes there are other disputes that are really simple and that they can be resolved without needing to go to the court, uh, depending on the timing. So it may be the company's out of bankruptcy now, and there's no reason to go to the court anymore. Uh, so it, it varies, but you do always need to be cognizant of the fact that the outcome of your mediation may have to be submitted to the court and there may have to be disclosures around why that settlement is the, the right thing to do in this particular case. This is also fascinating that we would really appreciate if without breaking breaching the confidentiality role of you as a mediator, you could really present some of the stories uh, that happened to you in mediations that were personally satisfying to you, especially bearing in mind for us as mediators of how many different groups of people, types of interests you deal with one particular single mediation. Uh, so that I've had a lot of really personally satisfying mediations, I will say. Um, I've been very fortunate in that regard. Um, I'll give you two examples. One's a bankruptcy example and one is not a bankruptcy example. And I'll actually start with that one because it's one that I did early on uh, in my mediation practice. And it's really always stuck with me. It was a car accident case. And um, the plaintiff had had just a horrible series of events. And I may not remember the exact order that it went in, but it within a five-day period, her husband died, 
she was diagnosed with cancer and she was T-boned in a car, horrible, horrible car accident by the defendant. And then the insurance adjuster, so when she called the, the driver's insurance company to make a claim uh, because of she suffered physical injuries and her car was destroyed, the insurance adjuster was horrible to her and told her to get her act together and she needed to stop crying on the phone and all of this stuff, even though, I mean, literally this woman in a five-day period had lost her husband and diagnosed with cancer and had this horrific accident. And so we got to the mediation and um, I worked really hard to one, give her a safe place to just share all of this grief. It was, she had carried it around and, you know, the way it works is you file the lawsuit, but by the time you get to mediation, a year may have passed. And she had bottled all this grief up inside. And I probably spent two hours with her, with her just letting it all out. Uh, and she cried and she shared, and that was very cathartic for her. And then I went, I spent time with the defendant, which is basically the insurance attorney and the adjuster. And I said, y'all have created a problem for yourselves. And in this particular situation, um, the adjuster would not apologize for his behavior, but the attorney said, this is totally unacceptable. I would like to offer an apology. And so I uh, took the attorney in with the plaintiff and she apologized. She said, you know, she was so sorry for all of these losses and everything and apologized. There were hugs, there were tears, and then there was a settlement. And this plaintiff at the end of the day told me that I had helped her move forward in a way she never thought would have been possible. So that, that to me is is literally the number one best experience I ever had as a mediator because I changed someone's life in a way that had nothing to do with dollars and cents and everything to do with allowing her to move forward in a more positive way through the rest of her life. Now, shifting to bankruptcy mediation, which does not frequently is not quite so heartbreaking. Um, I had a case several years ago and it was a multi-party dispute trying to figure out how they were going to structure the plan, who was going to get what, and what they were going to actually do with the underlying business. Was the business going to reorganize? Were assets going to be sold? What were they going to do? And they had all sorts of competing interests and views on how to structure this. But as the outsider, I was able to come in and say, all right, but so I hear you, you're really number one interest, the thing that is most important to you is this. And then over here, this is your most important thing. And this is your most important thing. And if these are, if we just pick what's the one most important thing for everybody, here's a way you can structure this that achieves all of those goals. And I was able to draw on my, I forget how long it had been at that point, but you know, 25 years of experience as a bankruptcy attorney and look back at cases that I had been involved in and say, you can do X and Y and Z and put the puzzle pieces together. And they had all been so focused on, I must have, I must have, that no one had thought about how do you connect these together and find a way for them to work. And um, so they were able to then go on and put what had been years of litigation because they'd been in embroiled in litigation prior to the bankruptcy. And then throughout the bankruptcy, they put it behind them. A portion of the company reorganized and went on. A portion of the company got sold. They worked through their issues and everybody was really thrilled with the outcome because taking us back to the beginning of today's program, uh, the professional fees are a priority expense that is basically taking money out of the pockets of the potential recovery for unsecured creditors. So they were thrilled to stop the drain, right? And uh, so that was a, a really fulfilling opportunity because I was able to bring my bankruptcy law experience to help these people find a path to resolution and move forward. 
Yep. Thank you so much for that. I, this reminds us all why mediation is so valuable. Because just like in the first story, you can have a out of court settlement in a way that nobody could have expected because you're not going to be getting hugs and you know apologies after a judge has made the ruling, right? And then the other example, you know, it really shows how creativity, you know, by a very um, knowledgeable uh, attorney slash mediator can bring a case to resolution in a cost effective way instead of having to go and duke it out in court where there's going to be a winner, there's going to be a loser most of the time. So, Sylvia, we thank you so much for sharing this. And um, I think the business aspects of bankruptcy law sometimes can be a little cold, right? Uh, a little soulless because it, you, you're dealing with entities and corporations and assets and all that. But when you bring it, you know, to the personal realm like that, I think that will connect with a lot of people who are out there who might be listening or watching. So we thank you so much for your time. And uh, as always, we always want to have you back to keep speaking about this topic because um, bankruptcy mediation, again, it's something that most folks don't have, don't want to think about even until they have to get there. But, you know, these are the things we got to deal with. So thank you so much. And uh, it was a pleasure, Sylvia. Mm hmm. Yes. And Natalia, do you want to say anything else to close? Yes. I wanted to say that, as always, in mediation, the human factor is the prevailing factor. Whether you deal with bankruptcy, whether you deal with family law or any other uh, thing, the human factor, the parties that are there, but also the person of a mediator really can change your life. Yeah. So and having the right mediating. Mediator. Yes. <laughs> having the right mediator can make all the difference. So, all right, Sylvia, thank you so much for your time, and we look forward to talking to you again. Bye-bye.